Commissioner Russell. I'll call it a special meeting order. Welcome fellow commissioners and the public to today's meeting of the special meeting of the County of San Diego's Independent Redistricting Commission. Let me first turn to the IRC clerk, David Hall, to provide additional information about today's meeting. Thank you, Chair Bain. At this time, I'd like to invite any members of the public who wish to speak to the commission today, please review the instructions posted on the redistricting website at drawyourcommunity.com. We ask that individuals who wish to speak to the commission complete a form in advance for planning purposes. All timely requests to speak from the public made at today's meeting will be honored regardless of whether you've submitted an advanced request. Agendas, minutes, and supporting materials for the commission's meetings are posted on the redistricting website, including instructions to request translation. Meeting agendas are translated into Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Tagalog, Arabic, Japanese, Korean, and Laotian as required by law. I'd also like to note that we've received 30 general e-comments and two emails, which have been distributed to the commissioners and added to the redistricting website. Chair Bain. Thank you much, very much, David. The next item on the agenda is the roll call. David, could you please call the roll? Thank you. I'll ask the commissioners to say here or present when called upon. Chair Bain. Here. Vice Chair Katerina. Here. Vice Chair Garcia. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Hansen. Here. Commissioner Inman. Here. Commissioner Krugliak. Here. Commissioner Larson. Here. Commissioner Pons. Here. Commissioner Russ. Here. Commissioner Serbin. I'd like to note for the record that the absences of Commissioner Chen, Diaz, and Dostal are excused. Chair Bain, we do have a quorum with 10 commissioners present. Thank you very much, David. Well, I note that the next item on the agenda is item three. We do have a firm start time for that at 4.15. It now being 4.02 with the commission's permission, I'd like to uh, take up agenda item four and see if we can deal with that so that we're ready to go still and we'll suspend as necessary uh, before 4.15 when we'll return to item three. So with that in mind and not seeing any objection, item four is now on the table, the discussion and possible approval of a resolution authorizing teleconference public meetings. This item follows the governor's recent approval of AB 361 regarding a simplified method for virtual participation by commissioners at RC moving, meetings moving forward. In in certain, certain circumstances. I believe we're gonna to turn to Hillary Gibson of council uh, for the presentation on this. Hillary. Hello everyone. Um, so the relevant background is detailed in the findings of the resolution that's before the commission tonight. So I am going to keep my comments very brief on this matter. Um, and of course we will be available for any questions should the commission have any after uh, our brief presentation. So recently state legislation, which is AB 361, was adopted that would uh, allow legislative bodies, including this commission, to continue operating as you have been for many months. And um, that is with simplified teleconferencing procedures that facilitate remote participation by both commissioners and the public. That legislation requires certain procedural steps to be met. The county health officer has um, issued a social distancing recommendation in order to facilitate compliance with these procedural steps. And the resolution that is currently before the commission this evening um, is consistent with that recommendation and consistent with the practice of other county boards and commissions. So uh, with that, Chair Baim, I'll turn it back to you. And of course, if there are any questions, we're here to answer them. Very good. Thank you, Hillary. Before we move on to a motion and discussion, uh, let me ask David if there are any requests from the public to speak on this agenda item. Thank you, Chair Bain. We did not receive any requests in advance to speak on this item, but if anyone participating remotely would like to address the commission, we'd welcome your comments. Please raise a virtual hand by clicking on the raise hand button on Zoom or by pressing star nine if you're dialing in by phone. Not seeing any virtual hands. That concludes public comment on this item, Chair Bain. Thank you, David. As this is an action item requiring a motion before any discussion, let me ask if there's a motion for approval of the resolution authorizing teleconference public meetings as included with the agenda materials. So moved. Commissioner Larson, second. Second. Commissioner Pons, did I hear right? Mm -hmm. I hope, thank you. Very good. Uh, any discussion from the commission or clarifying questions? Seeing none, 
David, could you please call the roll for a vote? Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, yes, I approve. Or I mean, they wrote it. <laughs> Commissioner Pons. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Um, mm -hmm. Commissioner Ress. Aye. Commissioner Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Diaz is absent. Commissioner Dostal is absent. Commissioner Hansen. Aye. Commissioner Larson. Aye. Commissioner Serbin is absent. Chair Bain. Aye. Commissioner Inman. Aye. Commissioner Katarina. Aye. Commissioner Krugliak. Aye. Chair Bain, that motion passes unanimously with all commissioners who are present voting aye. Very good, thank you. David, thank you, commissioners. I'm going to say something I've never said before. We had not planned to be this far ahead in the agenda. <laughs> so um, we have a couple of different options. One is we could just take a break and ask commissioners to be back in their seats. I would rather, uh, is Mr. Adelson's here? Yes. Fantastic, excellent. So seeing that we will move back to agenda item three, uh, an introduction of Bruce, and I hope I'm saying it right, Adelson. Yes, sir, you are. One for me, that's rare, but I'm, I appreciate it. Uh, the IRC's new Special Voting Rights Act Council, along with his training on the Voting Rights Act in support of various IRC duties, including the racially polarized voting analysis that we'll hear next week. Mr. Adelson is the founder, president, and CEO of Federal Compliance Consulting, and has provided federal voting rights redistricting and other programs for states, counties, and many other organizations. He has extensive redistricting and Voting Rights Act experience in three redistricting cycles since 2001. He has served in senior positions in the Department of Justice and is currently a faculty member at both Georgetown University and an adjunct professor, sorry, at the University of Pittsburgh. He also continues to advise DOJ, the Idaho Supreme Court, and the New Mexico Administrative Office of the Courts. Thank you again, Mr. Ailson, for taking the time to join us tonight and especially for providing this training. Uh, we appreciate as well your willingness to take questions. Commissioners, I think already know you, we have a hard stop with you at 445 or in about uh, 40 minutes. But the good thing is, I think that allows us even more time for questions and dialogue to benefit from your experience. So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and good evening to everyone. So we will uh, we'll begin. So the, the purpose of tonight is to give you an overview of uh, redistricting law, constitutional obligations from the, federal, from the federal perspective. So I'm gonna move through some of the slides fairly quickly, save as much time as possible for questions at the end. So um, there you go. That's a little bit more information about me. I was the Voting Rights Act expert for the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission 10 years ago, and uh, the commission faced several lawsuits after we were um, concluded. However, we won all of our lawsuits and we won including in the US Supreme Court, nine to nothing, the court upheld the legality of our plans. And for the first time in Arizona history, the Department of Justice pre-cleared Arizona's redistricting plans on first submission without any additional questions or objections. So. Uh, that experience informs a lot of the work that I do now, which really leads me to my next couple of slides. Next slide, please. Redistricting is a legal process. There are a lot of laws and rules to follow. There are a lot of uh, court requirements, guidelines, and I think it's always important, and I always like to start the process off by saying, this is a legal process. Everything you do in a, from a mapping context and making drawing maps is governed by various laws, court decisions going back years. Next slide, please. I also wanted to uh, point out that my friends at the Department of Justice put out for the first time ever, some redistricting guidance concerning section two of the Voting Rights Act, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. I mentioned this because I always think it's a good idea when DOJ does something, they don't just do something by accident. There's always some purpose. And I think that one of the purposes here is to alert folks about the Voting Rights Act and federal requirements uh, that I've certainly seen in my experience this cycle that a lot of the people who are involved in redistricting, this is their first cycle. So I think DOJ put out the guidance 
in part for that, give people some information and education about what redistricting is all about from a VRA and constitutional perspective. Next slide, please. As you can see, the Department the Voting Rights Act uh, prohibits discrimination. Oh, one back, please. Prohibits discrimination based on race, color, or membership in a language minority group. Uh, one uh, slide back, please. So as you can see, the redistricting really covers all organizations, entities, school districts, parishes, counties, cities, municipalities, special districts that hold elections, public elections. And as you can see at the bottom, the Department of Justice will undertake its usual nationwide review of districting plans and methods of electing governments in part of its enforcement work with Section 2 of the VRA. It is the department's view that guidance identifying a general approach to Section 2 would be useful, and I agree that uh, this is the first time DOJ has ever put out guidance in a redistricting cycle about Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Next slide, please. So these are among the lessons that I learned in Arizona and from our victory in the US Supreme Court. It's really important to show your work, have a transparent record, a complete record, an exhaustive record. Because at the end of the day, when there are lawsuits and challenges to what you've done, being able to show and explain why you did something is very important. Part of the reason that we prevailed in the Supreme Court was that vir for virtually every argument that was made, the Supreme Court said, well, their record doesn't show that. Their record shows the exact opposite of what you're claiming. So unless you have more, their plans stand and are legal and constitutional. So show your work, create a strong record, having objective expertise to help you move the process along, to guide you, advise you, and to make sure that this very complex process with many moving parts is put together in the best possible way to, to um, show why you did what you did. And just like we learned when we were, we were in elementary school in math class, and the teacher said, Bruce, show your work. Explain to me, show me how you got two plus two equals four. Well, that lesson carries forward into redistricting. Next slide, please. And there are a lot of requirements, as you know, there are a lot of requirements at the state level and the federal level for redistricting. And we're going to focus tonight primarily on the Voting Rights Act and what's called vote dilution, the dilution of minority voting strength in the creation of redistricting plans. Equal protection under the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution is very important, and that permits a certain amount of population difference, deviation, among districts to be underpopulated, overpopulated. We could talk a little bit about that. The Supreme Court spoke very loudly on this point in the Arizona case that I referenced earlier, and I'm uh, very happy to discuss that in, in more detail as we go forward. Next slide, please. Uh, and you're aware of, of uh, this is a typically a state level requirement, compact contiguous districts. Next slide, please and how you measure compactness. There are all kinds of uh, technological methods for determining whether or not a district, districts are compact. Next slide, please. The easiest way to look at contiguity is if you can walk from one part of a district to another and stay in the district, then the district is contiguous. Communities of interest is also typically a, a state or local level redistricting consideration that is, is true in many states. And I think that it is increasing in number, the places around the country that view communities of interest as important to redistricting. Next slide. When using vis uh, visible geographic features, mountains, rivers, also very common in redistricting, and they can be pretty good markers for where a district begins or where it ends. Next slide, please. An ideal population that uh, relates to equal population under the US Constitution. So one way to look at it is let's imagine 
that you have a state or a county or a city and there are a million people and 10 legislative districts or county council districts, you divide, divide the number, the, divide the population by 10, the ideal population of each district is 100,000. Uh, local redistricting, state level redistricting gives redistricting bodies more leeway to deviate from that $100,000, 100,000, excuse me, 100,000 population ideal. You have more room to um, uh, maneuver than states that create or commissions that create congressional districts. And those districts, the population must be virtually equal across all districts. That's a constitutional requirement. That's not the same for legislative districts. There's a little more uh, wiggle room. Uh, typically, the courts will look for a total deviation across all districts as being within 10%, 10% or less. But it's really important to remember that's not a safe harbor. It's not a guarantee that your plan will win a challenge to equal a population. That's just a very general guide that the courts have used, but the court was very plain in the last redistricting cycle in explaining, don't think this is an absolute um, uh, safe harbor, safe pass, it's not. Uh, so, but keep that in mind as a general range. It's also important that if you do not create districts that have virtually no population differences, basically have to explain why. And that goes to the record keeping, transparency, and showing your work. In Arizona, we spent a lot of time explaining exactly what we were doing. That all paid off in the end when the Supreme Court said, as I said earlier, yeah, that their record shows they did this. That's what we're relying on because you're not showing anything that proves otherwise. It's very important as you move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, this references what I just talked about, that 10% um, marker, if you will, good guidepost, but doesn't uh, ensure that your plan is constitutional or legal just based on the number. The Supreme Court has said very clearly that the Supreme Court does not expect absolute definitive mathematical equality. So they are expecting that there will be some population differences among districts at the state level or the local level. The key is you have to explain why, and that explanation must be a, an accepted justification under state law and federal law. Next slide. There's a little bit of a lag on our Zoom end. Okay. But oh. that's a, all right, great, thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk about one of the, the key aspects of redistricting under the Voting Rights Act. It's very important to remember that race is always part of redistricting. Just talking about race, including race and in decisions, is not inappropriate, far from it. It is what is essentially required. So as you can see in the, this references a couple of Supreme Court decisions that being aware of race when it draws district lines, just as you're aware of other potential factors, age, uh, religion, communities of interest, uh, all kinds of uh, demographic factors, it is one consideration. It can't be the main one, it can't be the only one, but it must be a very important part of the redistricting process. Next slide, please. So as you can see here that yes, just the idea that you are considering race does not automatically invalidate your plan. As I said, far from it. If you don't consider, uh, consider race at all, you're likely creating districts that are discriminatory, violate the Voting Rights Act, and may also violate the Equal Protection Clause of the US Constitution. Next slide, please.
But what is important in redistricting when considering race is not to do what Alabama did 10 years ago, as you can see in the first paragraph, not to prioritize and create mechanical, automatic racial targets. Well, what does that mean? What that means is not saying we must have a certain number of majority minority districts, or we must have a certain uh, district. This district should be 60% minority. The other district should be 70%. And for the third district, let's make that 75%. That's what Alabama did. Unless your decisions are backed up by what's called racial block voting or racially polarized voting analysis, just creating these or, or um, supposing that certain districts should just have a certain level of population without knowing the answer to key questions, which I'm going to mention in a moment, raises a lot of issues. That raises uh, considerations called hacking and cracking of minority voters, which we'll discuss a little bit later, and racial gerrymanders, meaning that you just put a, uh, an inordinate number of minority voters into one district without analysis to back it up. Next slide, please. And with that being said, and I, as I wait for the slide to change, there is a key Supreme Court case called Thornburg versus Jingles, which sets out three tests for the establishment of creating a majority minority district. All test three must be met. And they are basically, is there a, um, a majority of a minority group of one race or uh, a coalition of several minority groups who can make up a majority in one district. That's number one. Is that group compact is part of that calculation in a geographic area. The second is, do they vote cohesively? Do they vote uh, together to support the same candidate? Cohesive voting is a key aspect of this Voting Rights Act analysis racial block voting analysis. And the third is, do white voters vote as a block to usually impede or block the minority group or groups from electing their candidates of choice? Typically in racial block voting analysis, the uh, expert will uh, have a threshold by which minority voters can elect candidates of choice. So that's based on an analyzing election results, voting patterns, and then coming up with a statistical estimate for, okay, in this jurisdiction, in this district, Hispanic voters, Asian American voters, African American voters, for example, need 40% black voting age or minority voting age population to elect candidates of choice. That's the key metric to escape what happened to Alabama, just assigning voters, frankly, because of race in large percentages, as the Supreme Court found to limit their voting power, voting opportunities to just a few districts rather than more districts. So here's what I had mentioned earlier about cracking and packing. Cracking is dividing a minority group among several districts at percentages that are so low, 20, 25%, let's say, that they cannot elect candidates of choice. That would be discriminatory under the Voting Rights Act and likely a violation of the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Packing is what Alabama did, just putting too many voters into certain districts way beyond the number that they need to elect candidates of choice. The Supreme Court in the Alabama case actually found one district that was, let's say was 75% African-American to balance population in this, in this district. Alabama put in, let's say 20,000 people, 19,500 of them were black. That's not based on analysis. So they packed that district 
with more black voters than were needed to comply with the VRA and to elect candidates of choice. So what does that mean? Well, that means those voters weren't put in another district where they might have an additional district where they can elect whom they prefer. These are very common terms within the redistricting field and something to be very aware of and also to remember to partner with racial block voting analysis. All of this exists, the complementary. Racial block voting analysis informs percentages of minority voters in districts. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite examples of what's called a racial gerrymander. This was a few years ago in North Carolina. You can see the Supreme Court called this a particularly serpentine district. And yeah, it kind of snakes around, grabs various populations and avoids others. So this is, I'm always asked, what's a gerrymander? This is a gerrymander. It's so obvious what they, what they were doing. And it kind of informs that they were looking to include people and also exclude people. Next slide, please. And that really goes to the point of what happened in the case called Shaw v. Reno. It's not surprising that the court threw this uh, district out, claiming it was a race-centric district and could not be justified as a reasonable attempt to comply with the Voting Rights Act. So typically, if you have a weirdly shaped district that is a majority minority district, let's say, that may raise concerns and questions about being race centric, as the Supreme Court said here. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, again, just a, a, another example of being conscious of race and conscious of, of packing and cracking. So just reaching out to grab minority population and what I call narrow robot arms, just like you saw in the, in the Serpentine District in North Carolina. If I'm reaching out in that way to capture minority voters specifically, then that will likely be an issue of race, a race-centric redistricting, which the Supreme Court is uh, routinely uh, disfavors and is a, an issue under the U.S. Constitution. What's also true, too, is not imagining that all people of the same race vote the same way, whether there are differences of with country of origin, uh, whether it's in this hemisphere or another, also plays into voting analysis, voting pattern analysis, to determine that just assuming that, let's say, Asian American voters vote the same way without analysis to back it up is problematic. Next slide, please. And that key word that, that we will be talking about a lot, predominant. Having race as a predominant factor in redistricting is going to be a problem under the US Constitution. With the way I look at, at race and redistricting as we discussed earlier, it is a very important factor in redistricting, but it cannot be your primary focus your predominant focus, where you are consciously deciding, yeah, let's create this 60% minority district here and this 90% minority district here. It cannot predominate. It cannot overrule, overshadow all the other considerations that you have for redistricting. Next slide, please. I'm really stressing this mechanical targets. It's really important. You can't, don't, I hear all the time that, oh, we must have a certain number of majority minority districts. And then when I ask why, people will say, because we, that's what we have to have. Has to be analytically based. Cannot just make assumptions about how many people should be in how many districts because of, of an idea, because of a, you know, whatever uh, might present itself. It has to be analytically based. Next slide, please. Uh, and this will reiterate what, what I talked about earlier in the Harris v. Arizona independent redistricting case. Underpopulating a district or uh, using uh, justifications to 
that we were complying with the Voting Rights Act is a well-known acceptable practice according to the Supreme Court. It was something that the court emphasized in our case 10 years ago. Compliance with the Voting Rights Act is what's called a compelling reason or justification. If you can suggest that a particular deviation or decision was made to comply with the Voting Rights Act and you have the record to back it up, just as we did, then the Supreme Court will likely say, okay, that's all right. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite Supreme Court cases. This involved the districting in North Carolina. A uh, decision was four years ago. So here you had a situation where the districting body decided, well, we have to have X number of majority black districts, but there was no analysis about why, about what the population was, where it was, what were the voting patterns. The Supreme Court in this case found that this particular district, this area, that black voters had been electing candidates of choice for more than 20 years without having a majority. So this district performed or functioned to give black voters the opportunity to elect candidates of choice. But this was one of the districts that North Carolina said, this has to be majority minority. Supreme Court said, no, it doesn't. Because the patterns are very clear. There's been a lot of success among black voters electing their preferred candidates. And also there is a substantial white crossover support from white voters that made this area a very effective, powerful voting area where minority black voters. Bruce? Yes. Bruce, can you hold on a second? I think we've lost your sound and it's getting bad enough that it's hard to bridge. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Let me turn to the tech. Bruce, we, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, great. So let's go to the next slide, please. So this, that uh, middle paragraph is really the key. According to the Supreme Court, for most of 20 years prior to this redistricting 10 years ago, African-Americans made up less than a majority. The black voting age population was usually between 46 and 48%. So of course the question presents itself, well, then why do you need to create a majority minority district? Isn't that race centric? Aren't you using race to predominate in redistricting? when that is not needed to protect minority voting rights act, uh, minority voting rights. Supreme Court said it's not, and they threw the plan out. Next slide, please. Uh, just briefly, this slide and the next slide are uh, requirements under the Voting Rights Act minority language requirements uh, under section 203 to provide information in languages other than English about voting and, and election matters. Next slide, please. And interesting, San Diego County has several language requirements for the languages and the language groups that are listed here. And that concludes my presentation. Next slide, please. That's my contact information. And I am uh, happy to answer any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. That was very, very useful. Um, before I turn to fellow commissioners, let me check with David if there are any requests from the public to speak on this item. Thank you, Chair Bayman. I would like to note for the record that Commissioner uh, Serbin is present. If any member of the public would like to address the commission on this item, the introduction of Bruce Adelson, you're welcome to do so. Please raise a virtual hand by clicking the raise hand button on Zoom or by pressing star nine if you're dialing in by phone. Not seeing any virtual hands. That concludes public comment on this item, Chair Bain. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now turn to commissioner comments and questions. I have Commissioner Russ and Commissioner Inman, and we'll go from there. Commissioner Russ, please. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. That was, uh, you, you uh, quadrupled at least my knowledge of, um, of the Voting Rights Act, quite frankly. But, you Thank know, you. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get my, wrap my head around this because many neighborhoods are segregated by choice and many are integrated by choice. And, and, and so you would, 
I, I'm not sure how, you know, um, I'm sure they would be treated differently uh, in, in your uh, drawing the lines. Uh, uh, an integrated neighborhood would, I mean, how are you gonna get a, a, a minority majority if every neighborhood was perfectly integrated, you know, um, uh, with a um, uh, segregated um, patches of neighborhoods, I could see that being being simpler. Am, am I correct in that, Bruce? I think that's a that's a that's a great point, and that also goes to the core of what we were talking about. Everything is based on analysis and not assumptions. So rather than as as happens in Alabama and North Carolina, suggesting that this number is needed or that number is needed for to protect the rights of minority voters. It's all analytically based. The racial block voting analysis, which will be discussed, and my additional analysis and comments will further inform how this is viewed. But I think what's most interesting about your comment, Commissioner, is that really reveals one of the core aspects here, that this is a voting and election process. So what has the history been of voting in San Diego County? What has been the experience of minority voters being able to elect candidates of choice? All of that is, all those answers are driven by analysis, election results, and voting patterns. So I think that, that rather than, in addition to looking at populations in various communities and neighborhoods, we go into that being informed What's the voting history? What do the, elect the election results show us? Is there racially polarized voting? And if so, how much? How has how that impacted elections? So all of that goes into the decision-making process. So as I said, there are no um, gray areas or assumptions about, as they said in North Carolina, we just have to make this a majority-minority district. And the Supreme Court said, no, you don't because you didn't look at the voting pattern. Yeah, so if you had a perfectly integrated neighborhoods throughout your entire area, you might have a hard time getting a majority minority um, um, uh, district. That, that may be true and there may, yeah. that's one of the, one part of this is looking at crossover voting, for example. Yeah. What is the extent of racially polarized voting and how does that impact the election. So I think going into it, North Carolina made the deliberate decision to just create <clears throat> several majority minority districts kind of willy nilly without any consideration for what the Voting Rights Act says and what the 14th Amendment says. Supreme Court knocked them down and they said, you didn't do this the way you need to. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, noting we only have a few minutes left with Mr. Adelson, uh, Commissioner Inman, then Commissioner Ponce. Uh, thank you. Very, uh, very good presentation. Uh, my question is, we're doing this right now, this analysis today, because we're redrawing districts. We have new census data, so on. Five years from now, though, populations can change. I mean, can a challenge be made, like midterm, if you will, between the two censuses and succeed? a voting rights challenge based on populations that have changed census census? Well, I think that that's in a way you could you fold that into your process by realizing to your point, you have a 10 year window and sure things change, but also being able to potentially anticipate what those changes might be, looking at how your population has grown, where it's grown and which population is growing, which population may not be growing. So that's also something you look at, but the, any challenge based on the Voting Rights Act is a challenge today using the 2020 census numbers. Now, frankly, there are places around the country, believe it or not, that have not redistricted in 40 years. They have a major equal protection, uh, equal population problem, but the voting rights issues are really, whatever issues there are, are analyzed today with the current election results as you have them with the census data. So my thought is that if there were a challenge five, six years out, it could be, uh, it would likely be more on um, equal population 
if your deviations were out of whack, if you didn't give due consideration to uh, one person, one vote, uh, that, you know, with, with our discussions, that's not something we're going to be overlooking. That's one of the key aspects to redistricting. So uh, that will, uh, we should check that. We'll be checking those boxes off. Thank you, Commissioner Pons. Yes, Mr. Adelson, thank you very much. And I've done some research on your work and your body of work, and it's tremendously impressive. What you just gave me just created a juxtaposition between, for me, uh, equal populations versus equitable representation. And for me to juxtapose that, because you talked about the objective expertise, and you contrast that with subjectivity, which is what we get from these testimonies, it's going to be very challenging to sort of square that, you know, that equal population versus the equitable representation. If you had a couple of good nuggets to give me, I don't know about the rest of the commissioners, but to give me, to help me keep that straight in my mind and stay fair down the channel, what would that be? I'll use a word that one of my clients used in addressing just that very point, Commissioner. She used the word discernment. She said, we have to look at comments, maps that are brought to us with a level of discernment and not assume that what people are presenting are an objective truth, if you will, that in redistricting, there are a lot of people, as I'm sure you, you've seen, who are advocating for various positions, who are trying to get your attention. You know, it's just like, it's like lobbying in a sense. Not all the information that will be presented to you is unslanted, we'll put it that way. And that's something we can can walk through and look at. I've seen all kinds of public comments that suggest that this comment is right on the money. But one of the comments that one, one part of this comment is we have to create majority minority districts. You have to have three of them or four of them or five of them just because we, we should have them. And maybe you should have, but the analysis have to, has to show that. So that in these comments, it's rare, if not ever, I never see analysis. I always see, well, this is what we should have. This is what there should be. So discernment, I thought that was a great way to look at it. We all use our evaluative methods and tools, intuition to balance between objectivity and subjectivity. And it's also something that we'll certainly be talking about them and enable to empower and enhance the, the sense of discernment. Does that, does that help? It does, but there will be more to follow, I'm sure, as we proceed. Thank no. you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I'll just ask one, Bruce. Um, on one of your slides, you, towards the end, you mentioned the language groups that we have uh, in the county. I'm just wondering, has there been much in Voting Rights Act circles or even in broader redistricting circles, when you get into those language communities that may be subgroups of racial communities, where it may be one racial group for census purposes, but the, lang the linguistic differences or other differences could be dramatic enough to have a real impact on those communities and how they define themselves. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. That's something that we looked at a lot in Arizona. That's something that I do in, in work that, that I'm currently doing with some uh, redistricting jurisdictions. I know in Arizona, we, in, in working with Native American tribes, for example, we provided information in Hopi, Apache, Navajo. These are traditionally unwritten languages. And the chair of the commission had asked me to help navigate through the process. Part of that involves some cultural awareness, but also an understanding that these are not historically written languages. So writing something in Navajo will not be understandable to a lot of Navajos. So we put out information on CDs, a lot of audio information, worked very closely with the tribes in this example, and held meetings on, uh, on reservation. So, but having to your point, Mr. Chairman, the, an, an awareness of different communities, different languages, different cultures, I think that's also important for the overall goal of inclusion. 
We appreciate that. Commissioner Sturban will be our last question. Bruce, thank you for staying on for it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thanks, Bruce, and thanks for the wonderful presentation. I'm wondering with the when the RPV analysis is performed, if it's done correctly and properly, is it definitive as to what it concludes as to how we have to construct our districts with respect to race? A great question. I think that let's, you know, if, if there is no racially polarized voting or if there is or is not, that is going to inform going forward. As I mentioned that with the Thornburg versus Jingles case, best way to just remember that is Jingles. No one says Thornburg, everybody says Jingles. So remember that one of the considerations for a majority minority district is you must prove and you prove that through racial block voting analysis, that the minority group or groups cannot elect candidates of choice because their efforts are blocked usually by the white majority. So if that's part of racial block voting analysis, that will help answer the question of, do we need a majority minority district? Do we not? At what level should we have voting age population? Maybe it's 45%, 35%. That all depends on, on your county and what your voting patterns are. And that's something that can be analyzed. And I'm looking forward to having a fulsome conversation about that. Great. Well, commissioners, thank you for the questions and comments. Uh, Bruce, thank you for all that. We look forward to seeing you again next week when we'll hear both more about your analysis on the VRA aspects, and we'll have that connected, as I understand, with racially polarized voting analysis. So thanks again for all that. It's much appreciated. pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, commissioners. So with that, we move on to agenda item five, a demographic services update and summary of public input and maps received uh, that we're receiving from Flow Analytics, our, demograph our demographer. Uh, updated data slides with numbers from the statewide database suggested census data were included with today's agenda materials. For this item, I know we're all looking forward to updates from the flow team, uh, including on various comments and feedback we've received from the public and especially about communities of interest. This is our opportunity to hear from flow more about what we've heard from the public and review it and ask any questions, uh, especially in specific areas that we may have. I'll just remind commissioners that immediately after this and our next agenda item, we'll turn to how Flo used that public input to develop springboard maps. So first I wanna to turn to Commissioner Ken Inman, our single point of contact for Flo Analytics, and then here, I think from John McKenzie uh, with Flo. Again, this is an informational item um, and we'll proceed accordingly. With that, Commissioner Inman, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Chair Bain. Uh, so I was thinking about this, you know, we've been at this for like a year, right? Right. It's been a year, almost seems like yesterday, but it, it, it's actually been a year. And so that brings us to today. Now we have census data. We have public input, including information about communities of interest, uh, uh, public testimony. Um, we have educated ourselves and the public on redistricting. And so where do we go next, right? That's what we're looking at. Well, tonight, Flo um, will first, provide a brief on all the COIs, public input and testimony received to date. What are the themes, important points, common messages? And then we get to do what we do best. We get to talk about it and discuss and debate. Um, we get to make sure we understand it, ask Flo to clarify. We can go back and dig deeper reconsider various aspects and assumptions. It is our responsibility to leverage flows, capabilities, and expertise here. So that's the next section um, that we're gonna do. Um, uh, we have capabilities, or we have uh, capabilities as individual, um, excuse me, flow has capabilities that we as individual commissioners and the public at large don't have. And that's where this expertise really comes into play. And we're gonna hear about that um, in the presentation. Can you hear me? I'll just come. Just a little bit, yeah, up. it's a little low. Okay. 
There you go. People don't want to hear me, so I guess that's good. <laughs> um, and then after we get to uh, see several preliminary ideas uh, in the form of springboards about what it all means when you marry census data, various geographical features and entities, and public testimony. This is like GIS nirvana. You get to see mapping and data, and you get to see it illustrated all in one place. So Flow has used their experience and expertise to tee it all up, giving us that first in, uh, comprehensive geographic illustration of all the public input um, uh, that we've received and all the information on, on COIS. Uh, these, are map, uh, these maps are just a simple initial framework. Again, it's gonna be our job and responsibility to take it from there. After Flo's presentation on springboards, um, we get to turn and again, do what we love to do best, conduct a discussion, where again, we can review assumptions, implications of the process and whatever else we deem relevant to help us and the public move forward in the process to begin drafting maps. Flo is going to take all that information back. They're going to use it to inform their processes and prepare revisions um, for what comes next, which will be next week on Thursday. And at that time, we need to be ready to formally tell Flo what to do next. Tonight, we get to talk. Next week, we need to be ready to actually take action and direct them to create draft maps with the inclusion of the RPV um, analysis and report. And <laughs> to paraphrase a famous line, to go boldly where no redistricting commission in San Diego has gone before. Right on. <laughs> and then finally, um, tonight, we have um, a, agenda item seven. So not only do we get to look at the data, the maps, review all that information, we also do need to start thinking about and planning a structure on how we're going to get this done in an effective and efficient way. Um, so that's agenda item seven. Um, and then before um, I move on and, and uh, let John start doing the interesting stuff, I do want to talk about the uh, district scenario modeling tool. So the DSM it's a great tool for exploration, research, and visualization of redistricting data and information. Um, now, we're working to address um, to address those. And on the learning side, we're going to be. We can't hear you. We've lost sound. A city, city, some city from district A to district B, how to display a specific community of interest or Chair a Bain? specific city. Chair Bain, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, because we've missed basically all of what Commissioner Inman has been saying. Oh my. All right. Um, what was the last thing you we we thought most of it was getting through when we moved his microphone closer other commission um, there was something about now we're working to address and then from that point uh basically going in and out and you're muted right now hello can you hear that Kristen? yes now i can hear you mm -hmm. But if you're still talking, I can't hear you anymore. We can't hear you either, we Commissioner Bain, but I think that's because you're muted. The you're speaker camera team, the, the speaker cameras on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. We have. Yeah. 
yeah. we have a Wi-Fi problem um, where we we can't hear you again. Oh, my wife says I need to start after my joke. <laughs> we heard that very clearly, if that's a good sign. So commissioners virtually. I'm going to do a Barbara. sound check for the people who are participating virtually. If you can hear me, please raise your hand, commissioners. Okay, looks like we're back in business. We'll try Commissioner Inman again. No, I start right after the joke, right? <laughs> well, let's make sure they can hear him. Go ahead, do some testing though, and let's make sure. Test, test. Okay, so commissioners virtually, you can hear Commissioner Inman? Yes. Excellent, okay. So we will pick up
from after the joke or attempted joke, depending on your <laughs> choice on there. I thought it was good. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick up where I was talking about uh, the springboards, which is going to be agenda item six. So agenda item five is the background and the information and all the data and the uh, that we're going. Sorry, Ken. Sorry to sorry to interrupt, Ken. Were you also talking about technical difficulties at some point? That's I think where you were getting uh, cut off at. Okay, so do you want me to skip to? The, in other words, you don't want to hear from me anymore, Commissioner Kruzak. You want me to skip to the no, end? I, I, yes. No, no, I thought that was what I thought that was. I thought you were talking about technical issues um, with DSM that. That was around what I thought you were talking about when you started going in and out. And so okay. it sounds like springboards is past that topic. So I just wanted to make sure if there was something you mentioned that we missed that we heard it. No, I can go, I, I can uh, start talking about uh, DSM. So that's fine if everybody else, okay. So. Oh, uh, no, if you want to go back, I just wanted to make sure you weren't going forward. We're good. Go ahead with whatever you wanted to. Oh, no. Okay. So. I don't want to be redundant and waste time, right. actually. So the big thing is, did commissioners participating virtually? Did you hear Commissioner Inman talking about DSM? Yes. He started talking. So everything up to that point, you were able to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think picking up from DSM technical issues in the uh, case, the use cases. Okay. Is probably where to go. Okay. So. Um, in, in order to give us the tools that we need to do the work that we've been tasked with, Flow created uh, the district scenario modeling tool for us. Um, now, it's a great tool for doing exploration, research, and visualization on issues related to redistricting. Um, we do know it's hard to learn how to use. It's challenging. And there are latency issues with using uh, that platform. So to address the learning side of it, we are creating use cases. So these are specific step-by-step -step, uh, directives that tell you how to accomplish um, a, a lot of different tasks, the most common tasks, things like how do you uh, reassign a specific city from District A to District B? How do you uh, access information about a specific COI and display it, or a specific city or municipality. How do you select it, display it, and get the relevant information you need? How do you clear out everything on the map and just start with a clean slate? These are all things you can do. They're fairly straightforward, but you do need to have the right knowledge to work through those things. And so we will be pushing out use cases um, soon to uh, uh, to help with those tasks. And we think that's gonna do a lot to get people further along with feeling comfortable with the tool and using it. You know, familiarity and understanding kind of the process that you need to go through to make the tool um, um, work in the way that you want is, you know, 90% of the battle sometimes. And so we will be doing that. Um, if you have specific use cases in mind that you want to see, please uh, send those on to staff, Barbara, our standard process, and Barbara will get those out um, to flow as well as me, and we can uh, look at creating the appropriate documentation around those use cases. So I'm not saying draw a map that satisfy these criteria. What I'm saying is I wanna understand how to display certain types of information, how to do certain, certain functionality in the platform, how to accomplish that. And, and we'll look at doing that. On the latency issue, I think if you learn how to use the platform, you can understand what it should be doing next. And then you know, well, is the platform messed up? Am I messed up? Or is there something that I need to reset? Um, so hopefully uh, that will also make you feel more comfortable and, and kind of anticipate whether or not the platform um, is actually performing appropriately. Um, so with that, now I'll turn it over, uh, I believe most likely to John or the flow team to actually start uh, talking about um, all of this information and data, um, as well as some other demographic updates uh, before we get to communities of interest and public testimony. Thank you very much. John, before you start, um, Commissioner Kugliak, did you have an immediate question with the hand up? 
please. So in terms of the latency issue, it's just, you won't be questioning whether it's stuck. You just will learn to expect latency. Um, I think that that's a lot of it because you don't, some, you know, the issue is you don't know, is it stuck or is it me? And um, I think that that's part of the I wouldn't say that's. I wouldn't say that's all of the issue though. No, I agree. I, I definitely agree with that okay. statement. And so we are looking to see if there are things that we can improve uh, the performance, but I, I can't, uh, I mean, I, we need to talk more and we can bring back more information at our next meeting is probably the best response to that at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, John. Hello, can everybody hear me? All right, thank you very much. So um, before I get into my presentation, I do have a couple of quick updates to run through. Um, so the summary demographic tables for the county and its existing districts has been updated with the adjusted census data, and that has been posted to the website. I provided a detailed verbal description of this information last week. Uh, the major takeaway there is that there were no significant changes as a result of the up, uh, adjusted data. The next item that I'll give a brief update on is the RPV analysis and report. Those are both complete and uh, want, we'll be hearing more about those uh, next week. But the report has been complete, uh, completed, the analysis has been done and the report has been submitted. So with that, let's get into the summary of the public comment and the community of interest testimony that uh, we have received thus far. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Just a second here. And I think we should be good there. All right, so let's discuss some of the trends that, that um, we have been seeing in the, um, in the COI data. Um, now, what I'm gonna tell you about here is just, um, I just wanna be clear, this is uh, everything we've received. And really before I get into that though, I just wanna pull up a map real quick. Just want to show you uh, something. Let's see if I can find it. So this is just a map of just the community builder submissions that we've had. But even from this, you can see some trends starting to sort of come to light here. Um, so this is a really a fairly small portion of the total amount of information we've received from the public. Um, however, you can see in this case, most of these are concentrated in the, uh, in the northern part of the county, as well as in the southwestern part of the county. The other thing I think it's important to take away from this is that a lot of the boundaries that people are drawing overlap, right? They're, all, they're concentrated in similar areas, but they also overlap. People are referring to places, uh, similar large areas, but sometimes the boundaries don't always equate. Um, so that's just, a, I think, an important visual to start with here. So now let's get into a bit more detail about the communities of interest uh, and, and the, um, the public comments that we've received related to the uh, community of interest. So, as of September 30th, we have received uh, 518 unique public comment submissions. The vast majority of those have come in through the e-comments. Uh, there's also been uh, a number of um, in-person and remote comments and, and testimony as well, followed by the community builder, letters, emails, and other. Honestly, I'm not sure what other is, unless it's phone calls or telegrams, not quite certain. Um, but the vast majority has been uh, sort of in that 
bulk, the bulk of the e-comments, the in-person remote testimony, and, and the community building. As for a timeline, as when these comments have been received, um, as you can see, they really started to pick up around the time of the first public hearing, um, which makes sense, given that those are the comments that are making up really the bulk. And they have, uh, it's continued to sort of uh, expand as we've gone through. All right, so what are people actually saying in their comments and their testimony? Well, it, it is varied and there's certainly nuance to them. But when you look at the totality of the comments, you can begin to pick out some trends. So in terms of peop how people are describing their communities, uh, a lot of these comments describe their communities through a shared cultural background. Others are referring to their shared experiences or uh, challenges, um, concerns about particular issues, uh, as you can see with environment and climate and others. Um, it's also important to know that a lot of them are, are nuanced. So even though I'm putting these categories for the trends, it doesn't mean that they all fit nicely and neatly into these. Um, that's not the case. Uh, and a lot of them address multiple uh, uh, you know, more than one of these issues that are here. But when you're looking at, like I said, the totality of it, these are the things that are really rising to the top that people are using to describe uh, their communities. So what about the geographies that, that we're seeing referenced in these? Well, most of them are referring to pretty large areas. That was something that I, I thought was uh, interesting to note. Um, more than small specific neighborhoods within a city, what we're seeing is more larger areas. So um, South County, North County, uh, Highway 78 corridor, those sorts of more regional areas are, are, are popping up more so than, like I said, those real specific neighborhoods. Um, and then municipalities, that's something that also stuck out quite a bit. Many people are referring to their community of interest as the geography of that community of interest being their entire municipality. Uh, and in some case, it may be their municipality and their neighboring municipality. Um, we are also seeing some for the unincorporated um, communities and neighborhoods, um, but overall, those are certainly less than the regions and the municipalities uh, um, in terms of the trends here. Looking a little bit further, um, North County, and I think you could. this was illustrated by the community builder submissions as well, has been, um, it, it's being referenced very frequently as a community, as the community of interest that people would like to see preserved. Um, but once again, when we're talking about, this is sort of talking about at that regional area, the sort of larger um, areas that people are talking about, we're seeing North County, South County, Highway 78, East County, San Diego border communities. And then when we get down into the municipalities, um, Carlsbad, once again, falls in the North County area. So there is some overlap there. We're seeing a lot of discussion of Carlsbad, San Marcos, Oceanside, Escondido, um, uh, and so forth. And um, if you haven't figured out from the way I'm talking, the squares are, the size of the square represents a, a general um, sort of volume of the submissions. Uh, I purposely have not included the specific numbers for these simply because of the nuance and the specific numbers aren't anywhere near as valuable as seeing the sort of proportional share of what the, these represent. Um, and then when we get into the unincorporated areas and neighborhoods, uh, this is what we're seeing here. So City Heights and Fallbrook have really stood out um, in terms of being uh, mentioned in these, in these comments and discussed. Um, and then as well as you can see all of these here and you know, this handout is something you have so you can also continue to reference this. So what does all that mean and where do we go? What do we do with that information? So I just wanna refer back quickly uh, to this chart that I used in a presentation a couple of presentations ago, which is that you know springboard scenarios, that's what we've got next. And so 
that is really the first thing we do with this data collection, which will continue, right? This is gonna keep going as we work through the mapping process. But we are at a point now, as Commissioner Inman was discussing, where we have data, we have census data, and now we have community input, and we can put those together to start making maps. And so that's where we are with the springboard scenarios. And I know that is the next agenda item, so I am going to pause. But before I do that, I just want to throw up a reminder, and I might even start my next presentation with this slide, just to quickly describe what the springboard scenarios are, and more importantly, what they are not. So the springboard scenarios are starting points. They're nothing more than that. They're not draft maps. We didn't, we draw the draft maps all the time, and we don't draw springboards the same way we draw a draft map. We draw springboards specifically thinking about how are we going to give people a good starting point so that they can make the maps they want. Not how are we going to give them maps that they want. No, how are we going to help them get started with the mapping process? So the springboards, they are not draft maps. They're designed to facilitate the development of the draft maps. And they are designed to represent the communities of interest and show them. And they are also really helpful to sort of illustrate the trade-offs between different scenarios and between, um, you know, try to show that balancing act that the commission is gonna have to perform as you go ahead and, and start um, working towards draft and final maps. Um, so with that said, that's the end of my uh, first presentation here. Okay, let me bring up the main screen again for now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, are we still on screen share? Yeah, with John, and I'm sure it'll, yeah. Pat, John, you're ending your screen share, right? Yes, I'm sure I am. Good. Thank you. Very good. Well, um, thank you, John. Thank you, Commissioner Inman. Uh, thanks to the entire flow team. Thanks to staff. And thank you, commissioners and public for your patience. Let me first turn to members of the public who may want to address the commission on these issues. David, are there any requests from the public to speak on this agenda item? Thank you, Chair Bain. If any member of the public would like to address the commission on this item, please raise a virtual hand by pressing the raise hand button on Zoom or by pressing star nine if you're dialing in by telephone. And I don't see any virtual hands, so that concludes public comment on this issue. Okay. Uh, one moment, there may be a latency issue and I do have a virtual hand now. Very good. I'm going to allow uh, Rami Ibrahim. You should have a notification that you've been unmuted. You'll have three minutes to address the commission. Please begin by stating your name for the audio record if you choose to do so. Hi, commissioners. My name is Rami Ibrahim. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, were you looking for public input on these uh, springboard uh, scenarios or are you more so looking for public input on the first draft maps that you will release? Thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any further virtual hands. That concludes public comment on this issue, on this matter, Chairman. Very good. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm sure it will be addressed in our discussions coming up. Um, again, for now, this is an informational item, but I want to move on so we can get on to this, the springboard. I'm going to start calling them scenarios. I kind of like that term. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, but for now, let me just remind commissioners, uh, the focus for this moment is the presentation that was just made in the comments Commissioner Inman and John offered beforehand. So if we can restrict to that and save any comments on the springboards for later, that would be helpful. I have Commissioner Serban and then Co-Vice Chair Katarina, please. Thank you, Chair Bain. And thank you for the presentation, um, John, and, and the work on this, Commissioner Inman. So my question first is, um, the the, com, the COI data that we gathered, it was used to create these springboard maps. Um, what are we going to do with uh, additional COI data moving forward? How do we what do we how do we make use of that? If we make use of that, so 
the COI data will continue to be collected and continue to be uh, analyzed and added um, to maps. It will be, um, we will be able to present that information to you on other uh, mapping tools as well. We are working to assign geographies to as much of that data as we possibly can. Um, obviously, uh, as I, I showed, some of it's easiest when those come in through the community builder, but not all of them do. Um, and when I, I do want to just say, you know, that the community of interest information is used to inform the springboards. Um, it's not necessarily used to completely draw them, but it's absolutely used to inform those types of uh, the maps that, that came about in the springboards area. So those will continue to be added to all the tools that we use, um, and we will continue to provide the information about the communities of interest to the commission as we go. Okay, so when you say you're gonna add them to the tools and the maps, you mean to like the, the community builder? Or what? I don't, I don't know what you mean by that. Ideally, yes, we will get a lot of these into, into the community builder. Um, we may have another uh, mapping tool um, where we can see some of these things um, in terms of a uh, visually, so you can see where the, all of the submissions are on a map. Okay. Um, and I think you, I heard you say earlier that through Community Builder, most of the input was from the Northwest or was maybe regard, was about the Northwest and the Southwest parts of the county. Does that mean that we need to generate input regarding the other portions of the county? Um, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I would say, you know, my, 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 I don't feel that that would be my, my call to make of whether you need to generate it. I'm just trying to show you the information that we have. And those are definitely the concentrated, the areas that the, the information we have received are concentrated. I guess maybe let me ask the question a different way. Is there a deficiency in the data that you see? I mean, because you're saying that we have a lot of data for these parts. Are, are there, is there, do we need more data in other parts? I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. If we're looking at the North, we have a pretty good picture of what the community specifically wants us to do with the maps based upon the testimony that we've received. If we are looking in, I guess it is sort of the, you know, the middle uh, of the central part of the county, we don't have as much information to know exactly what uh, folks in that area would like us to do with the maps. Jay Bain, can you hear me? Yes, sure. Oh, listen, I'm just going to I'm going to drop off because my computer is about to do a hard restart and I can't stop it. It's just doing it on a cycle. So I, I'm going to do it now and then come right back in. OK, good. Thank you, Commissioner Pons. All right. Oh, your audio one more time. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, I think you can continue now. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so I, I'm not sure where I, I cut off, but. Um, the gist of what I was saying is in the north and the areas that we do have all of these submissions, it's very, it's, it's becoming clear what the public would like us to do in those areas or would like, you know, the maps to look like in those areas. In the areas where we... We only lost about a second. Do you want to try your audio one more time? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Not sure how long, but uh, please continue. So in the areas that we don't have information, we just don't know what those the, the people in that area specifically would like that. The, I know it. You're
Staff, are we ready to try again? We should go ahead. Okay, John, can you hear me? In order to best know how the community would like us to handle the maps in those areas where we do not have public testimony, it would be best to have it, right? We know what we can see from the trends, what people are looking for in the north and the southwest corners. We don't necessarily know that more nuanced information in the central part of the county, in the middle, uh, and, the, and the, around this, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, John. And um, one last one with with the the these the word map and the geography count. Like, are, did, I'm just kind of wondering: did, was it basically just you went through all the public comment and just like did a word count of like how many times City Heights appeared, or how is how is it done? Yeah, no, we use. A, I mean, in in a way, it's part of that, but we use a, a tool that allows us to sort of um, separate out the comments, um, as well as some of the other fields that are included in the submission form. So there's a, a name and there's also a place where people can check off what they're talking about. And we're able to um, sort of combine things and parse them out to help target so that we're not just, because there are a lot of comments that are like, oh, I used to live in City Heights, but now I live in so, uh, somewhere else. And so we are looking for those things. Um, so it's not just word count. That said, it's not, it's not perfect. That's why I didn't include specifics, specific numbers. Um, if you look at specific numbers and counted them and went through each one, you probably wouldn't come up with the exact same number. It is meant to generalize trends. But that said, it is a bit more than just a simple word count. There's some, we're able to query the totality of the information that's entered um, in a quite a different number of ways. So we can make it a bit more accurate than just a simple word count. I guess I was just wondering, because I, I thought I'd saw a number of comments mentioned like the coastal zone or, you know, the coast. And I, and I thought of that as a geography, but I don't see it and, as a word that appears. So I'm kind of curious. It why. was coastal communities. Um, and we may have. So one of the other things we did is some standardization. So in terms of when people people will say coastal cities, coastal neighborhoods, things like that. Um, and then. Uh, so we will try to group them together to a degree um, in terms of things that to identify the trends. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. Good. Um, I'll know Commissioner Ponce is back with us and has his hand raised. So I assume he has. He'd like to ask a question or offer a comment. I do. Um, and thanks a lot, John, for your presentation. Uh, in your categories of comments, you, you listed a lot of things, but we got a lot of comments regarding that surrounded ethnicity, uh, race, and economics, and I didn't see that in your list. So as you continue to draft and draw your, your, um, your little categories and your squares, those three contribution areas are going to be pretty uh, important to those individuals that made them because they were sort of charged comments. And I like to see those because when you overlay those, I think it will give us a density in the, in the form of a color that says in this certain area where you have a high degree of uh, high population of refugees, those comments were really sort of uh, concentrated in that area. And I like to see that visually as we start to uh, sort of illustrate and draw the boundaries to sort of capture those comments. But I don't want to miss those comments. I don't want to miss the ethnically, uh, the ethnic comments, the racial comments, and the economic comments as we start to draw the maps. Even though we don't have the data for the economics portion, I like to see those captured in the community of interest contributions, okay? Thanks. Yes, we will do that. Thanks for that. Long mic. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, Seeing no other comments, John, thank you for that. We'll move on. I will offer just as a bridge comment, if you will, um, John and Commissioner Inman, I assume there is no problem with the public continuing to submit inputs, maps, comments, everything else they possibly can. And Flow Analytics will find a way to incorporate all that as we go through the process. Is that a fair way to state it? Uh, yes, and we're going to keep the tools up, the, 
the COI tool and accepting public comments until December 2nd, I think is on where it lists on our schedule. So yes. Co-Vice Chair Garcia. But so Chair Bain, can I um, clarify, or can you clarify for me? I think the question was, is comment welcome on the springboard scenarios or the springboard maps? And I'm assuming that they are welcome on all scenarios, maps, draft maps, correct? The simple answer is yes. <laughs> springboard scenarios, springboard maps, draft maps, or anything else. We, we will be careful with any comments on uh, Commissioner Inman's sense of humor. But beyond that, we welcome all comments. All right. Moving on then, thank you for that. Um, and I won't say much thank you because we're going to continue the conversation with agenda item six, a presentation of springboard maps or springboard scenarios. And I will say by way of introduction, I'll take responsibility for any confusion that's echoed on this. It's my job to help define the agendas and the topics in a way that as as clear as possible. And frankly, I like the term springboard scenarios because it helps make clear, I think, what John, exactly what John was just saying. These are scenarios, these are reflecting inputs, they're capturing them in a pictorial way, but they are not draft maps, which is a process we will get into with instructions next week and actual maps the following week. But the springboard scenarios are products and structures that we can accept comment on including from the public. So uh, again, I wanna express my appreciation for the public input and express appreciation for the commission's willingness to look through all this and make sure they understand it and ask informed questions. So with that, um, and a reminder that just what John and Ken said, uh, we will have to issue some more formal instructions for drafting of the first draft maps at our meeting next week. That's when we will get into the instructions. So I'd ask commissioners to keep that in mind as we go into the next presentation. Uh, I think we'll first turn to Commissioner Inman again. No, we'll go straight to John, good. Uh, and we'll get into the springboard scenarios. John, please. Very good. And so um, you should have seen a PDF, a very long um, PDF that included maps and a lot of information about each of those maps. Um, for the, uh, for this, for, can everybody see my screen? I don't see the little green thing. I wanna make sure you see it. Okay. Um, so uh, for the, it, you know, rather than scrolling through a PDF, I, I wanna, it's just easier to look at maps sometimes uh, in a, a little bit of a different way. Um, and so I'm gonna go through these springboards using uh, this, uh, sort of web interface here. Um, what I would like to do is once again re-emphasize that these springboards are, once again, they are not draft maps. There's never any intention that anything we drew here would ever be adopted or uh, anything like that. The intent for each of these is to, having looked at the community of interest testimony we received and, and the public comment, to take a very high level approach as map makers and say, okay, what are the things that we're hearing people want? And what approach might you take to sort of start making maps that satisfy those things? And, and that's really where it came from. We sort of cut ourselves off at that point. We look at it and we say, all right, well, I see that some of these comments really want to preserve the border communities. So we would draw a scenario that does that, and then we would focus more on population balance. But it is really just to, meant to say that this might be one way people want to go. And if they did want to go that way, this would be an easier map to start from than maybe the existing scenarios as they are, or from a map that has nothing on it. So that's really what these springboards are. They're meant to give you a boost as a commission as you get towards draft maps. Um, I do want to note quickly, in terms of feedback on, on scenarios, uh, springboard scenarios, what's most helpful is to look at them and say, this is what I like about this one, and this is what I don't like about this one, um, and, and to look at it this way. 
look at it that way and, and consider the approach that was taken. And then what do you like about that approach? Or what do you like in terms of the, um, you know, what, what the map looks like considering the approach that was taken? Um, so those are the comments that we um, find most helpful in terms of taking these and turning them into something that will become a draft map. So with that, let me, let me just get into this here um, and I'll skip through this. <laughs> but this is springboard scenario one. I'm going to zoom in a little bit bigger. Um, and this represents a map that focuses on preserving BIPOC communities, uh, immigrant refugee and the border communities around the Southern part of the county, as we mentioned. That was um, a trend and a theme that we found through the communities in, uh, through its public testimony. And so uh, we did that. Um, that was a springboard. And as you can see, that, that, that area, the border communities, are preserved through District 1. Um, but of course, with all of these maps, there are some trade-offs. There are some other things with this that if you're looking at this approach that, that don't quite work. Um, one of the things that we noticed is uh, in, in the South, um, the cities of Chula Vista and National City were at times referenced um, in, in the comments about um, immigrant and refugee communities, but these are split. These are not completely contained in District 1 in this scenario. Um, and then up North, uh, sort of this is sort of the cascading effects that can happen when you focus on, on doing one area. There's always these trade-offs. So then up North, there was uh, a lot of conversation about Fallbrook and it remains in District 5, but just uh, across I-5, we have the community of Rainbow, which uh, is now split into a separate district. So there are some things uh, about this map that if you're at the North, you may like, and some things that you may not like. Um, you know, Carl, in this situation, Carlsbad is not a part of District 5. It, it is uh, in the same district as Encinitas. So, um, this is sort of, once again, scenario, <laughs> springboard scenario one. It's just a starting point. This may, you may see some things and say, oh, I wonder if I just move that line down here, what would happen? That's great. That, those are the type of things we can test out. Um, so within this tool, and we'll make this tool available, um, you can also click and see the community of interest testimony on top of this. So this has the community builder responses. Um, we've included the uh, Native American reservation data as well that was coming from San Diego GIS. Uh, the municipal boundaries are here. Um, this is also a neighborhoods uh, layer that is coming once again from San GIS. Uh, military facilities and those are hard to see. There are little uh, white lines there. And then the existing district boundaries. So you can see how they have um, these differ from those. And once again, those are just uh, there for reference. Um, of course, this springboard, we made all our springboards. We want our, we don't try to give springboards as much as we don't ever plan on them being draft maps. We also don't want to give you something that is completely unreasonable. <laughs> it doesn't meet basic requirements of equal population. So this does have a population uh, deviation of 0.8%. Um, and the other metrics uh, you can see in front of you on your PDF as well as in here. So continuing on to scenario two. Scenario two is an interesting one because it did focus on what happened if things were just kept the same. Because um, every single mapping project we've ever worked on, there are people who just want to keep everything the same. So I think almost every springboard scenario, every time we do springboards, there's a scenario that says, well, what does it look like if you don't make many changes? Um, and this still uh, does make some changes. There's a, an attempt to create greater population balance than exists currently. Um, and in, in some cases, you can see that we have uh, District 5 has, had, has come in you know, quite a bit to the West. Uh, as a result, um, the cities of, um, uh, so as a result of moving that over, we have Encinitas and Carlsbad uh, remaining in the um, fifth district. Um, but of course, the entire east portion of the county now is under uh, District 2. Um, additionally, Escondido has moved, been moved out of District 5 or is in, and is completely contained within uh, District 3. Um, and so once again, you can 
look at some of this information, uh, some of these here, municipalities is most interesting. I believe that this scenario uh, does not split any municipalities um, amongst different districts itself. And once again, it's at 1.8%. So it did, you know, it was, how do we keep it somewhat the same? But uh, I think the population as it stands at 5%, but what if you bring it down? Because people are gonna wanna bring it down. Um, let's look at three. So scenario three, um, this one's interesting in that it, it looked at, okay, what are the major arterials? Um, the things that are really lines, uh, you know, lines in the, in the map that people would easily refer to as district boundaries. And so um, in here, you can see when you do that, we were able to uh, take district five and once again, include Encinitas and Carlsbad in the, in the same area, as well as many of the uh, Highway 78 cities. Um, there's a, uh, a, a, a district one doesn't capture the entirety of the border communities down here. Um, <clears throat> But there are still some things that, that um, are a little bit, you know, not sort of maybe some issues here. So once again, Fallbrook and Rainbow uh, were um, often uh, discussed in uh, communities of interest as being similar communities. Um, and those would be split by I-5. Uh, and then um, I believe the city of El Cajon is maybe split in this, situ in this scenario as well. Um, but it's a way some people like to go, right? A lot of times uh, people want to look at, you know, how can you draw a map um, and use some of these very well-known arterials that are often uh, considered uh, boundaries. How can you use those as boundaries? What happens when you do that? And so this is, once again, a starting point for uh, scenarios that might want to take that into consideration. And... Scenario four. Scenario four is attempting to really uh, preserve um, the North County as well as those the border areas. Uh, it does that with districts one and district five. Zoom in again. And I'm gonna add the municipalities. The municipalities are all kept together in a single district. However, you will notice that um, Escondido is uh, part, it is contained in a single district, but it's in district three. Uh, the north remains, um, you know, the northern cities uh, of Encinitas and Carlsbad are actually split uh, between different districts, um, but they are both contained in a single district. However, this, uh, a lot of the 78, um, Highway 78 communities are, are preserved. Um, and Chula Vista and National City uh, are both, in this case, unlike in scenario one, where those were being split across districts, uh, in this case, they are uh, contained within district one as well. Uh, and the population balance of this one is 1.7%. And uh, here are the numbers. And of course, you have more detailed uh, maps on your printouts. Um, so that, that concludes the presentation of the springboards. Um, you know, the biggest takeaway from this is look at these maps and think about them. Think about what you like, what you don't like. Um, and they are not draft maps. <laughs> but I, I can't emphasize that enough. But they are meant to hopefully make the mapping process a little bit easier um, and get you on your way to making draft maps. So with that, I'll take questions. Okay, John, thank you very much for that. Um, before we turn to the public, let me just see, Commissioner Adam, did you have anything you wanted to add from the SPOC perspective? Okay, so uh, with that, let me turn to David to see if there are any requests from the public to speak on this agenda item. Thank you, Chair Bame. If any member of the public would like to address the commission on this item, we would welcome your comments. Please raise a virtual hand by clicking the raise hand button on Zoom or pressing star nine if you're dialing in by phone.
give an extra few moments. I see no virtual hands, so that concludes public testimony in this matter. Good, thank you for that. And again, we will be continuing to accept public comment on these and other aspects of all our work through all the usual channels on the website. I just wanna make sure that's absolutely clear and understood. All right, we'll turn to commissioner comments and questions, including but not limited to along the lines John described. I have commissioner Russ and then commissioner Serbin and then commissioner Inman. Commissioner Russ. Yes, uh, John, on, on uh, scenario one, for example, I, I see Point Loma and Coronado is still in uh, district one. And, and if I want to change that and put that into, um, what was it district four? Uh, I mean, how would I, how, how do I actually do that? How do I, um, is this, this is from DSM, is this from the DSM builder? Is that what this is? John, Commissioner Inman wanted to jump in on that. So if you don't mind okay. him first. Okay. So we, uh, that is use case number one, <laughs> almost is how to move geographies between uh, districts. So uh, I don't know if we want John to show us how to do it here, but in the DSM, you definitely can do that. Um, and John, or John, these scenarios will be loaded into the DSM so commissioners can manipulate them within the DSM. Is that a correct statement? That is correct. We are actively working on that and it should be ready um very soon okay so there they are in the dsm that that will be in dsm database yes. uh, okay good yeah and uh, uh ken inman uh, gave me a tutorial on how to change things so i wanted to make sure that's where they'd be thank you okay so the current list i have is commissioner serban commissioner inman commissioner hansen co-vice chair garcia so with that commissioner serban Thank you, Chair Bain, and thank you again, John, for another uh, terrific presentation. So just so I understand um, the, 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 the four different scenarios, the first one you said was mainly um, drawn to, um, to preserve the, the BIPOC population in the center of the map. Um, the second one is more like, okay, let's see what we can do to maintain the existing district lines. The third one you said was informed mainly um, through the a look at the at the arterials and, and the streets and highway system, I guess. And then the fourth one, what was the fourth one? So the fourth one was focused on uh, the both um, some of the communities of interest that were discussed in the northern part of uh, North County, as well as the the border areas and some of the surrounding cities in the uh, southern part of the county. What I will say though, is that the community of interest testimony is included in all of these approaches. So um, it's not that, like where we talk about major arterials, we didn't get any community of interest testimony. It's like, hey, we wanna see a scenario that you know, focuses on major arterials. Um, that's more of a, that's something we see quite a bit in mapping. Um, so we're still trying to preserve uh, and represent those trends that we're seeing in the communities of interest, but going on an approach that we often see used in mapping. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's, um, that's I guess, your, what your, an your answer to my question kind of reinforces my impression, which is the fourth map is the one that seems most responsive to the, to the public comment that we received. And I think you said it was because that's because the fourth map was drawn to be to take into account the the, the coy testimony about the north and the south. Is that what you said? Yeah, and I mean they they all they all do to a degree, um, but they also do factor in other things too, right? They're all like it's not like we drew them with any of them without thinking about that testimony. But that one, the fourth, definitely was driven almost entirely by that and population balance. Okay. And then the, um, I understand that you had also um, considered other boundary information, it, or maybe you did, I don't know, uh, or maybe that's a question. Did you also consider other boundary information when drawing, uh, when coming up with, with where these lines were drawn in the springboard maps? And by other boundaries, so, I mean like um, in the community builder tool, there was like the, the data, 
thing that said like you know different school districts and police beats and all those different things <laughs> yeah yeah um i can't say that we considered every single one and every single scenario um but uh in particular the um unincorporated neighborhoods and i'm sorry i don't the san gis data has different names for one of one of the neighborhood files is like law beats um i so i forget if i don't know the exact file names but yes, yeah, some of the incorporated communities uh, that and the CDPs that we had were absolutely considered as boundaries. Um, I I personally drew one of these. I drew scenario four, um, and I did not include uh, school districts, for instance, when I was when I uh, looked at that. That was not a layer. But for each of these, we did have other boundaries that we were looking at as we were drawing the lines and popping up and. And, um, and and seeing where they they were, yeah. Okay, and and so is for for the public for them to um, when they look at these springboard maps, do you would you also recommend because you, what you've said was you know for us to have a productive conversation, the, maybe the best way to think about this and have a conversation about it is okay. This is what I like, what I don't like. Is that also the way the public should talk to us about these maps so that this is this is how we hear from them about it? Is that the best way? Yes, to that's absolutely what I would recommend, um, particularly for the springboard maps. Um, really, that's helpful for all of all of the maps. Um, but for these springboard maps, absolutely. Um, because it's always going to be that balance. There's always going to be things some people, you know, that you like and things you don't like. And the best thing we can do is get all of that information. Um, it's it's less helpful when somebody says, this is just the map I want, <laughs> because it, that's just not how it works. It's so much more helpful when people can say, what I like about this map is this, and what I don't like is this, because then we can start matching different scenarios up and, and coming up with a solution. Okay, thank you, John, appreciate it. Thank you for that, and especially for the exchange about the public, which is continually useful. and. Um, John, I'll contradict you just a little bit because I still love to see public. And if it makes it difficult, we will find a way to help you out and make it work. But it, it, it's good to have them contribute. Okay, Commissioner Inman, Commissioner Hansen, then Co-Vice Chair Garcia. Commissioner Inman. Thank you. Yes, great presentation. And I don't think John meant just public maps. I think he meant a map with no description as to why you drew the lines the way you drew them. And that's because lines by themselves, I would agree, aren't useful. We need to know why you put them where you put them. Um, but in terms of the information that we're gonna be getting back going forward, in all of these scenarios that were put together, none of them did totally preserve you know, that 78 corridor completely, like the Carlsbad, Vista, San Marcos, Escondido, it didn't seem. Um, there were various collections of those cities um, but one of the things that, um, I mean, would we be seeing going forward is why you can't satisfy some of those, like part of the feedback I think we're going to need as a commission is why can't some of these things be done? Um, why aren't we seeing it in the, the, uh, the information that's coming back? So uh, as well as telling us what you can do, you will be telling us what you can't do, if you will, John? Yes, absolutely. Um, and the fact that, you know, as I mentioned with springboards, we're not trying to draw, draw perfect maps, but we are, we, 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 we still want them to meet the, we don't want to put anything out there with like a 15% deviation. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it, we are considering some of those factors in there. But yes, we will absolutely be explaining why certain things just, just don't necessarily work with the math uh, as we move on. Very good, thank you. Commissioner Hansen. Hi, thanks, John, so much. This has been sort of fun to work with the maps, but not as easy as I hoped it would be. But <laughs> I just have one question is that, do you have any, is there a way that we could see an absolutely blank map of the county and then we could sort, we could try to build our own districts from core areas and then fill in the blanks around them. Is that possible? That is, that is absolutely possible. Um, and honestly, uh, we can have that as a starting point. 
in, I mean, that's actually what in the DSM, what the starting point normally would be, but most, it, a lot of times in our experience, that's what people don't want. Um, unfortunately, actually, I mean, I actually think that's the best way to do it, quite frankly. Um, but so yes, that can be done and we can do that and we can make sure that's something that's available to you. Thank you, that would help me. I also am worried about some of the comments that, that are not addressed in any of these maps. Like we've had some pretty vocal groups claiming that their vote was diluted by certain other people that were included in their group in their district. And if we don't do something about that, when we've had such pointed uh, requests from a number of different people, we're gonna have to be able to explain why. I mean, they're gonna come back and say, wait a minute, you asked for my opinion, I gave you this, and so did a lot of my friends, and yet, why didn't you do it? So, I, I don't know, I think the same thing about the coastal district, there's been a lot of conversation about keeping the coastal district as whole, and in some of those, they're, that's divided up into four different districts, the coastal Pacific Ocean front, divided between four different districts, that would upset people. So I, I, I'm concerned about that. Noted, and that will definitely be, the, those are the types of things we will be working on, I think a lot next week as we sort of get to draft maps. Um, okay, uh, Co-Vice Chair Garcia and then Co-Vice Chair Katarina. Thank you, and thank you um, for that presentation, John. Um, is, that, is that better? So I have a couple of questions and maybe a couple of comments. Um, first comment was about, uh, I kind of want to push back just a little bit on um, uh, Commissioner uh, Serban's comment about map number four being the most responsive to the COI public testimony. <clears throat> I didn't actually see it that way. And We can't hear you. Rosette, you're muted. I think we may be losing because I'm seeing some of the commissioners virtually. You're not hearing co vice Chair Garcia? She's muted. Rosette is muted. No, I'm not. Well, she's not. Yeah. The, the... Shows on our screen is muted. My screen. Can you hear me okay, Commissioner Brown? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> You're not on my screen though, but I can hear you. And Rosette's mute is slashed, so. Yep, on my left. Yeah. Hmm. I barely heard a little bit of that comment. She's just saying that that's just her laptop, but the audio coming from the room is the the room speaker. So that's mm -hmm. why she's muted, but we should still be able to hear her. Mm. Okay, that could be the problem all along. Go ahead and try. How about now? Okay, great. Um, I don't know where you started hearing me or uh, when you when I lost sound. So I'll, I just wanted to say that um, I was just speaking to the comment about map four and um, that I heard comments that the um, coastal part of, of uh, North County didn't feel like they had much in common with rural East County. So I, I know that's something that we're gonna have to figure out as we uh, move forward on drawing boundaries. Um, but I think I also wanted to comment on the fact that I noticed that um, I don't think I saw Coronado or Point Loma, except in one scenario, um, moved out of District 1. And I think maybe that was what Commissioner Hansen was referring to. Um, I think we heard a lot of comments about um, District 1 
not having those two communities in their in their district. So I, I was um, curious about as to as to that. Um, and then um, there was, oh, I know. One other thing I wanted to point out is, and I think we're going to hear from this, we're going to hear from Ken about this. And that is what I understand that we should be providing to you or how we should, we should be thinking about this is when we look at these um, scenarios is not only what we like and what we don't like, but that we should be actually thinking about it in the context of our um, statutory criteria, like what we're required to be um, considering what the priorities are when we when when we draw boundaries. And then finally, I guess I would just like to understand these scenarios that we're looking at tonight. Um, are we going to see these same scenarios next week, or what is the process. I mean, I, we're giving you, we're, you know, sort of giving you some feedback and I'm just wondering if that's going to affect at all where we're going to start from next week, if you could clarify that. So that was a lot, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> Can I just, I want to talk about the Coronado Point Loma, maybe more than I, I should. And we should probably, I think that's actually more, um, uh, more, that should be more next week, but I will say, um, because I was looking at the, those comments, I saw those comments, um, and there are some, there are some mapping challenges that make that only doable if you divide some other communities uh, that would also object to being divided that way, um, and. Like I said, I think we're going to talk more, and this kind of gets into the the next question, which is, you know, the idea for these maps and for next week is to look at these maps, not just right now, and, and you know, you've had them for a couple of days, but to continue to look at them, and then next week is really when we will take comment on what you want us to do, uh, to direct us to start creating draft maps. So I want you to sort of digest these for a little bit longer. But I played around with that Coronado Point Loma thing for like probably way too long um, because it, to me, it was kind of an interesting mapping exercise. Uh, but um, anyway, so um, I'm just going to, we, we can talk, I'll be happy to talk all about it next week. <laughs> Thank you. That is much clearer to me. I was just a little bit fuzzy about the maps we were seeing tonight and what we were going to be doing next week. and what our conversation tonight, how it might be uh, instructive or um, useful um, for you all or for the next step. But that, that's very helpful, thanks. Thanks for that exchange. And can I put it on? Yeah, you all can hear me okay? Um, just to echo what was just said, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again at the end of this agenda item and the next agenda item, uh, there's no formal action or motion tonight. Rather, Flo and the SPOC and staff are going to work together to capture all the comments tonight, all the questions tonight, and have responses and um, whatever it takes to show that's being addressed, including on why something might not happen. And um, as John just said, they'll have more to say, I'm sure, on all that. But I'd ask commissioners to consider it in terms of providing comments tonight, particularly where it will lead us to some specific guidance and action next week, so that when we have a formal direction on how to draw the actual draft maps, it will be an informed discussion already set up. I hope that helps. Uh, Co-Vice Chair Katerina. Thank you, John. Can you all hear me okay? Um, I just have a suggestion. Um, I would like to see, if at all possible, some of the minor highways, so the 52, the 56, the 78, the 76, because a lot of those did come up in comments. And, and I think we all know where they are in general, but it might be nice to see those on the map in addition to the 15 and the five and the 805. And that's it. Thank you again for your presentation. Yes, and we, we can do that. And it actually, if there are 
we can go through the comments and, and even pick out specific highways and things that could be emphasized a bit more so. Um, because sometimes if you just, the way the maps work, the, the streets can be at like different grades. And if we elevate them all, it can just make a messy map that's hard to sort. So if we know the specifics, which we can figure out, we can probably make it a bit easier to, to sort through. John, continuing on that theme, I think um, a good guideline might be the state routes uh, because not only are they well-traveled, but several of them are either very close to or on the existing boundaries. And I think there've even been some public comments along that line. So starting with that, and then I, I would also say anything on or near existing boundaries or in uh, that communities of interest have cited, I know some of them have cited highways and uh, streets below that level, anything that was popped up in those that um, would help illustrate the trends, I think would be useful to include on that. Um, I know Commissioner Serban is requesting the floor, but in the interest of fairness, I wanted to see if any other commissioner who has not yet spoken wanted to any, offer any thoughts, comments, or questions. Seeing none, Commissioner Serban. Thank you, Chair Bam. So, John, I was just wondering, was there, did, were you able, is there a scenario where we can have the 78 cities together? And what I mean by that is Escondido, San Marcos, Oceanside, and Vista. I mean, I, I, I don't, I can't really, I will, I'll put it this way. I'll say the population would make it very challenging, but I don't know for sure because we're just so early in the mapping process. But I, I will say that there's a, you know, the population there is really high and it's really concentrated in that area. So I think it would be challenging, but I haven't, I haven't done enough mapping of these to say, um, one way or another at this point, whether or not that's yeah, possible. The DSM is just like not easy to make that happen. But I mean, that, I, I, wanted, I wanted to see if it was possible to create a map where, I mean, because so much of our testimony is centered around that. I, maybe it's just recency bias on my part, but it just seems like I wanted to see if that was even a possibility. I would, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think I can give you a, a, a good answer no, like a, yeah, that yeah. I would feel comfortable saying. <laughs> No problem. Yeah, maybe like, you know, if, if we can explore that going into next week yeah. or something. Yeah. And John, I would include in that um, anything more on exactly why those populations are challenging or why that area is challenging relative to nearby populations. I think that falls right into the category of what you and Ken were talking about, giving us reasons something can happen as well as reasons something would be conceivably difficult to happen, I think would still be very helpful at this stage. And again, I, I hope it would generate some public comment and uh, public reaction that we could incorporate into our thinking. And and one other thing, John, is um, you know, in some of your comments when you were talking, it sounded like you had had some, you had commented that um, Encinitas and Carlsbad and some of the maps were were split. And I don't necessarily take that as a as a negative on some of these maps. I think um, in many maps, if if Carlsbad and, and Encinitas have to be split in order for Carlsbad to be grouped with the cities along the seventy eight corridor, I think that's that's a that's a fair and good trade off. So I don't know. I mean, because you're looking for feedback right now, right? <laughs> what what I like and don't like about the maps. That's that's what I like and don't like. So thanks, Commissioner Kugler. Um, is it appropriate for me to answer uh, Commissioner Serban's question about the counties around the 78 corridor, or is that better for discussion in the future? It is certainly appropriate to use now. They fit, even if you include Carlsbad, if you include all five cor uh, cities in the corridor, they don't go above the population. You lose everything north. So you lose Pendleton, you lose Fallbrook, you lose Bonita, you lose everything over there. And so basically the East County and the West County becomes this very big, broad thing. And if you want North County to go all the way up to the North, it's not doable. Commissioner Krugler, are you saying then that, that that district would only consist of incorporated cities? Those five districts could fit. And then if you kind of like plug in the hole to make it a little bit cleaner, then yes, um, okay. but nothing uh, north of that. Thank you for that. Seeing no other comments, 
I'll offer thanks again to John for springboarding us to a very useful discussion. And if I'm continuing with Commissioner Edmonds' movie history that I'm even a bigger fan of than him in TV history, Scott, Captain, my engines can't take any more of this, but very well. Moving on. John, thank you very much. The next item is agenda item seven, a discussion of the procedure for mapping meetings. Now, this is a topic that the officers, Commissioner Inman, council and staff have been talking about the best possible way to recommend how we conduct our discussions as we get into actual maps to have both the efficiency and effectiveness included so that we can make the best decisions possible. Let me turn again to Commissioner Inman. Thank you. I don't have a Star Trek comeback. <laughs> so anyway, I'll work on that next meeting. <laughs> um, as uh, Chair Bame did say, we have been trying to address our favorite topic, and that is length of me meetings. Uh, in other words, trying to find an efficient and effective way to conduct our business, especially when uh, it comes down to giving directives to flow about how we proceed with creating draft maps. And so that's what this is about. And if you, uh, oh, sorry, go to the next slide, please, the overview slide. Thank you. Um, you know, this basically looks like a standard agenda item. And that's what it is here, the first part with one significant introduction in here, and that is, uh, commissioner statements. So there's a new component that we're looking to add to the meetings where each commissioner can make a statement. And I'll talk more about that as it says uh, for details in slide six, but that's pretty much the main change. On this slide, we're also calling out that we actually have three types of meetings, special meetings, regular meetings, and the draft map public hearings. Each one has certain things uh, that distinguish them. Um, uh, and this is talking about uh, right here, the number of days that we need to post agenda materials for them. Uh, but there are some other things uh, that uh, um, I'll spell out as we go through. So if we go to the next slide, um, regular and special meetings, um, the only difference between those is uh, posting of agenda materials. Otherwise they follow pretty much the same format as I outlined before. And so I, I just am noting that here because if we go to the next slide, please, you'll see the difference between a regular and a special meeting and um, a draft map public hearing. So the only difference in the structure uh, when we look at mapping items with the draft map public hearing, we actually convene the public hearing. Flo is gonna do their presentation up front, similar to what we just did or what we just heard from Flo. And then we'll break for the public hearing part. This was like we did in our pre-draft public hearings. We had a statement about um, what we're doing and redistricting, and then we took public testimony. Um, that's the same with these. It's just now we're gonna be talking about the draft maps that are under consideration. Um, after public hearing is finished, we adjourn the public hearing, and then we convene into um, a regular meeting or a special meeting. At that time, we then go and take up um, the issue of uh, you know, uh, the rest of the items that would go into a meeting. We take the commissioner statements, we then go into motions, IRC discussion, and, 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 and what have you. So the only difference here is we um, adjourn the hearing, or uh, yeah, we adjourn the hearing and then convene a regular special meeting. So onto the next slide, just as again, a reminder about the schedule and when these things will be happening. And also we, we call out when agenda materials are expected to be released prior to each meeting. Um, because as you're gonna see, you know, we need to be prepared when we show up at these meetings. And so the agenda materials are what we need to have read, understood, spend some time with before we go into these meetings. And so, um, it's kind of calling out here exactly when you will be getting those agenda materials for the specific date. And then, you know, there's a short thing that talks about exactly what we're uh, going to be doing in the, each one of those meetings. Um, we still have November 20, that Saturday meeting as tentative to be determined. So at some point we'll have to decide um, whether we are holding that meeting. We also have moved um, the uh, one meeting in November from the 12th to the 13th. So now that is on a Saturday, that was the veterans 
day meeting that we moved to a Friday and then a Saturday. Um, so if we go on to the next ben, one. Can we, before we leave that slide. Of course. Um, I did want to mention to commissioners that while the formal deadline for materials to be distributed for the special meetings is one day, we're going to try to do everything we can to get it in commissioner hands and posted for the public well before that, if at all possible. Now, some of those meetings are going to be harder than others because there's uh, less time between the previous meeting and the next one. But I know Flo is going to do all they can. Uh, I know Ken's working on that with staff so that if at all possible, we'll try to get those materials out more than one day in advance, hopefully at least two days, maybe even more than that, depending on the meeting involved. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear with regard to the special meetings. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And so if we go around the next slide, yes, the great, thank you. Um, so this is kind of going into detail on the various components of uh, what we're gonna be doing. Flow presentation um, on IRC draft maps, that's similar to what uh, Flo did today. So nothing, uh, nothing uh, new there. We will standardize the reporting that goes along with these. So, um, you know, you saw some of the reports and information presented today, but we will come up with a very standard table. So you know what to expect, you know where to find things, and it makes it, you know, easy to compare and contrast the various solutions because all the information will be standardized in a format um, uh, that will be shared along with the maps. Of course, then we'll go into, we always have, whether it's a public hearing or a standard agenda item, we have the public comment period. So that will always occur. The public will have their standard abilities to provide testimony. They can provide draft maps. They can provide comment on the existing draft maps. Um, you know, they can provide the testimony that they uh, feel is valuable and useful for the commission conducting its business, um, sticking with the uh, standard uh, two minute, um, two minute timeline for that. Nothing new there. Now we get to the kind of the new part. So again, the intent here is to help the commission be able to understand what, you know, what, uh, 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 to understand the various maps and, and what the pluses and minuses are and to do that in a way that we can kind of work to reach consensus. I mean, we do wanna to iterate towards a solution here. And so you need to have a process where people can reveal preferences. I guess this is the economist in me speaking now, can reveal preferences in a way that everybody can understand them. And then we can use that, um, that information to help us um, guide towards a solution. So that's what the commissioner statements are all about. So we, after public, uh, after the public hearing, public comment period, each commissioner, uh, we put two minutes down, you know, that's up to chair discretion or the officers, I suppose. We'll see how it goes. But each commissioner would have two minutes and the expectation is there would, you would come prepared with comments. And you'll see on some of the bullets what we're looking for down there. But the intent here is for commissioners to come with prepared statements. Those statements can change, obviously, because we will be taking testimony. And so something could be said maybe that changes your, your statement. Um, but each commissioner will have two minutes and the order will be done by our very sophisticated randomizer uh, that David Hall manages and maintains there. And so I have complete faith that um, he will do that. So random selection of commissioners, each one gets two minutes to provide comment. And again, what we're looking for, and this is what John uh, emphasized, um, as well as some of the other commissioners in the discussion here, we need uh, very specific information. Which of the maps or scenarios do you like? Which ones don't you like? And why? And the why part of it needs to be focused on the statutory criteria. You know, it just can't be, I don't like that shape. It reminds me of whatever. It has to be specific about some of the statutory criteria um, that we have to adhere to. And we're gonna also produce templates that we will share with commissioners to help guide you. You don't have to use the template. You're preparing your own statement, but there are some very specific things that we need to understand um, about why you do or don't prefer a map. Yes when you're done with this slide, I just wanted to 
please it. finish it. Yep. Okay. So um, I did want to just highlight for the public, because I think there's been some uh, uncertainty about this based on some media coverage and some outreach we're doing. This process is what we will follow for all our mapping, map drawing meetings. That are not, That is not just the two public hearings. There are several meetings where we'll be doing this, and we will very much encourage public comment, as we usually do, but it'll be at, at that slot. We'll have an introduction by Flo, then time for the public to provide comment. Then we'll look for the commissioner statements. I wanted to make sure the public knew that because that's their opportunity to directly inform the commissioners that day with those maps before the commissioners speak. And I did want to highlight for commissioners, it'll be really important, whatever you prepare ahead of time, to listen very carefully to the public comment, because it may have, I hope, a good impact on what we discuss, starting with the statements. So a lot going on, but the, the good part of it, and compliments to Commissioner Inman on doing it, on designing it this way, lots of opportunity for public comment and for commissioners to take that up. So thank you. And uh, I guess the the other follow on comment I wanted to make about that we are I think it's important that we have a mechanism in place for in the meeting for staff to capture stated preferences of commissioners because um, that's going to help us um, as as we get into the next part, which is motions. So after commissioner said next slide please. And so after um, after commissioner statements then we move into the period where the chair is going to ask for a motion. And um, so we need a motion and that motion is about providing flow with direction about what to do or providing direction uh, for a specific draft map, um, a map submitted by the public, um, or it could be some combination of the existing maps under consideration. So these are just some of the uh, types of motions that uh, uh, definitely could come up. Um, there can be a motion to discard or drop uh, a map. So, um, you know, all of these were uh, the various types of motions and along with, you know, like motions to change a draft map in a specific way. It could be something like take draft map B and move city, you know, ABC to, um, you know, uh, district, whatever, you know, so it's, it has to be, it can be somewhat general, but, you know, the more specific in terms of the directives, you know, the better and the easier it's going to be to navigate this process. Um, and as we iterate through this, again, the idea is going to be start with a lot of maps and things to consider and then work to whittle it down, to narrow it. Okay. So if we go on to the next slide, um, so we have a motion that's been introduced. And so, you know, say we have, right now we've got four scenarios. So we've got, a, we've got a situation where there are four scenarios under consideration, or once we get down the road, four draft maps. Um, well, we need to have some kind of directive for each one of those maps, at least one set of things for, that we're telling Flow to do to come back with a refinement of that. And so this is a process to help us iterate through coming to, um, uh, to uh, uh, a motion for each one of those maps. And now um, we've set in some time limits here. Um, again, that's the discretion of the commission um, and such to change those, but this is a starting point. So um, after, um, uh, after a motion is introduced, um, we, we talk about 15 minutes, so a clock starts ticking. And in that time, um, we need each commissioner that wants to comment um, have a chance to do so. So again, this is where the chair is gonna exercise their authority to ensure that everybody has the opportunity to provide comment. That may mean that some of us won't get to make multiple comments or, you know, whatever it turns out to be. But it's important that everybody have their opportunity uh, to make a statement. Um, during this period, uh, it is going to be appropriate to ask flow questions or uh, clarifying statements. So we have a motion on the floor to move uh, city A from district 
whatever to another district. And so we would expect Flow to potentially be able to quickly give us a, um, an idea using one of their tools or the DSM to say, well, that looks like that's gonna change the population by something like. So simple requests to Flow to actually do online mapping would be appropriate questions to other commissioners, or if you have a question of the person who actually put out the motion. So a dialogue back and forth between commissioners and back and forth with flow is something that we envision and see going on here. Um, after the appropriate amount of time, all commissioners commenting are 15 minutes, we definitely need to get to a vote. You know, we know <laughs> these discussions, friendly discussions can go on for a while. We do need to get to a vote because we will have multiple maps to consider. And so, you know, we do need to enforce some kind of uh, time limit or line so that we come to a vote. And the process here is once we vote on a motion, pass or fail, then we move on to a different map. We move on to a motion about a different map. And we iterate towards that sort of a process until each map has been considered at least once. So if we have five maps, you know, have a motion about the first map, it fails. Okay, that's fine. Move on to map two, have a motion about that, passes fine. We move on to map three, you know, passes fine. We move on to map four. I'm going to be optimistic that passes <laughs> fine. We move on. So that means we've got three of the maps have direction. So flow knows what to do. First map failed. Well, now we'll go back and revisit the first map and ask, does anybody else have a different motion for that first map? And if so, we'll entertain that. We'll go through this process and discuss it, take a vote and pass or fail. We'll do this, but if a specific map can't get a passing motion after doing this three times, then it will just be considered uh, a map that we can't come to consensus on. And so because of lack of uh, 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 a lack of uh, direction, it's not considered anymore. So it essentially um, is dropped. So that's the general process that we've laid out or a framework to help us get to consensus um, on maps. And that's pretty much it. Very good. Thank you for that, Commissioner, and, and for all the thought that went into that, as well as all the others who contributed to that. I'll now turn to David for any requests from the public to speak on this agenda. Thank you, Chair Bain. If any member of the public would like to address the commission on this item, you're welcome to do so. Please raise a virtual hand by clicking the raise hand button on Zoom or by pressing star nine if you're dialing in by phone. Not seeing any requests to speak. That concludes public testimony in this matter. Chair Bain. Thank you very much. Let me just make sure all commissioners participating virtually can hear. We're doing well on that, good. So the list I have at present is Commissioner Serban, Commissioner Hansen, Commissioner Krugliak. So we'll start with Commissioner Serban, please. Thank you, Chair Bain. And thank you, Ken, for the work in coming up with this. I know. That was, it looked like a lot of work, so thanks for doing it. Um, I, I'm wondering, um, can you mention that there was a, a template that's being developed to assist commissioners in providing um, feedback on the draft maps? Um, do we know maybe when that might um, be, be, be available? And I'm wondering, uh, and the reason why I'm asking is it sounds like it would be a good thing to maybe also provide to the public as well and help them to guide their feedback to us? That's a good question. Uh, and uh, we're, um, hopefully we can get to that next week. We have, we have a rough idea of what it looks like, um, but we don't have a specific form of it. You can expect it to um, essentially be the statutory criteria and some kind of uh, a box where you say um, it, you know, this is where I can rate as to whether or not this does or doesn't conform with the criteria. Um, so it's going to be centered on the statutory criteria. And then there'll be a box for other comments, but it would be the uh, statutory criteria would be the main things that we would be listing on that. Okay. 
Okay, very good. Thank you, Commissioner Hanson. Thank you, and thanks for all that information. I want to emphasize what for me is really important, and is that's the ability to have a conversation with other commissioners about things. Very often, if you make a comment, there's no feedback. It just goes somewhere. And I, I think that some of the public has expressed frustration about that because they don't know that they've been heard. And just like tonight when Christina was able to answer or provide information directly to Ramesses about his question, and she wasn't sure whether she was allowed to do that. But I think that's something that we're missing here. Um, that's certainly the difference between what goes on in an ad hoc committee and what goes on in formal meetings. And that's the beauty of the ad hoc committees. And every chance we get, I, I hope we will try to encourage you. You called it dialogue. And I think that's critical. And we're gonna need to use that in order to make our decision. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Krugliak and then Commissioner Ponce. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of small comments. The first one is at the point where there's a motion on the floor. Um, I would love it if uh, we just imposed a one minute timeline. 15 minutes is the same as 14 of us each getting a minute. Um, and in the event that no one wants to comment, that just keeps us well below 15 minutes. So I feel like that's only a good thing. Um, I had one question, which is the, the idea of limiting the number of motions on the floor. So I just went back to the bylaws and it said, except for as expressly laid out in the bylaws, we shall be governed by Rosenberg's rules of order, which allows three motions on the floor at a time. So I'm wondering where we're coming in um, enforcing just one motion. My concern there is specifically that, as you can imagine, unless every single person is waiting unmuted with bated breath, there's going to be an obvious edge to people in person who want to throw out a motion. There may be 14 people who want to throw out a motion. Um, I, you know, I think we're all going to have very strong opinions about these maps. How do we get to a good motion in a way that's not just a lot of people throwing out a motion? And why are we forcing a limit on precisely one um, at a time per map when that's not per rules of order? And secondly, why are we forcing us to go through all of the draft maps? It might be beneficial at the beginning to do some kind of a straw poll. And if uh, 10 of the commissioners say three of the maps are not the ones we're going to move forward on. I see very little uh, benefit in spending 45 minutes later in the meeting discussing a motion on each of those three when the quorum has already made a statement. Um, so just general questions. Since Commissioner Pons is the only other commissioner requesting the floor, let me take his comments, then give the floor to Commissioner Inman, uh, and then see if council wants to weigh in, or perhaps the reverse order, we'll see. But in any case, yeah. Commissioner Pons, can you hear us okay? Yeah, we're losing on one screen, but working on another, so I think it's okay. Okay, Commissioner Pons, please. And my question goes to Commissioner Krugliak and how she answered the question that Commissioner Servant asked so quickly, I mean, uh, I don't think you did it in your head or maybe you did. Were you playing with the tool at that time and you were clicking and holding and click, click, click and all of a sudden you had a flash and you had the, the lines drawn and the numbers therein? Is that what oh, you did? Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. Okay. Oh, no. Because, and, we'll, and we'll leave it at that. Okay. I thought maybe you had cracked the code because I saw, a, I saw a path to solutions there and if you had broken the code, I was definitely interested. That's all I have, thank you. Nope. And Commissioner Krugliak, Commissioner Krugliak puts me to shame on diplomatic skill. She's outstanding, thank you. All right, um, let me turn to Commissioner Inman for comments, then council for any comments they have. Um, yeah, um, uh, they bring up very good points about motions and I don't, know exactly how we'll handle that because obviously if a motion's on the floor somebody can put a substitute motion out there somebody can amend it and so i don't have specific answers to those kinds of things and how we control the process 
Um, I, I would leave that to the chair and other officers or maybe even um, uh, council can guide us in how to do that. Again, I do think it's extremely important. You know, we have, we, we've got to have some way to focus on getting to a vote. Um, you know, that's the main thing. And I also hear um, what you're saying about if we've got three maps that nobody really is interested in, let's just 86 them up front. And so that's why I think it's important in the commissioner statements that everybody reveal, I like this one and I don't like this one. And we will see that up front. And if everybody is saying, you know, this map, you know, isn't preferred, then I would expect the first motion to come to the floor would be get rid of that map. And, you know, no discussion. I said, well, you know, we'll open it to you always, you know, you always, we will have discussion on that, but I would expect a little discussion and we just vote it off. So. Yeah. Um, and the questions from my perspective are all completely valid and good. I wanted to be careful that we didn't go too far down this road of defining the procedure until we'd have a discussion about it like we're having tonight. Um, on the specific issue of coming to a meeting thinking where more than nine commissioners have already thought, oh, those two or three maps aren't going to work. I can see that, but I also want to leave the door open for public comment because it may be that there's some public comment that comes up that changes the mind of several commissioners on whether those maps may need further discussion. I uh, completely agree with the spirit of the conversation and I think Commissioner Inman just captured it well. We want to be trying to narrow things down and any action taken is a constructive action that moves us forward, not just something to say, we'll keep that map alive. I also want to keep in mind Commissioner Hansen's point on dialogue. Um, which will be a little challenging with one minute time limits. But one of the ideas or one of the advantages I see in the opening statements is commissioners can have a better idea of where other commissioners stand. And what I would hope is that in the discussion on any individual motion, commissioners can start not just by making their own point, but taking what they heard in the opening statements and building off that. So it's a it's not just a dialogue, it's a building dialogue that happens as efficiently as possible. Um, on the specific issue of how rules of procedure are applied and um, any, everything from substitute motions to points of order, I'm not sure. Um, since I'm hearing plenty of overall interest and agreement with this process, I think now we'll d dive into more of the second tier issues, uh, particularly with council. There is certainly a, an option to suspend the rules when necessary. Now, I am very, very careful about invoking that. But if we get to the point where that's the way to move forward on a couple of motions at once, we'll do it. Um, but there does need to be both a process that gets us to a decision as well as a process that allows us to have the kind of discussion and interaction among ourselves and ideally taking on public comment that we need to do. So certainly more to hear on this. Um, we won't have to invoke this process next week because we'll only be doing a motion on the instruction to flow for the draft maps that we will consider the following week. However, just to be clear, on Thursday, October 21st, when we have our first draft maps, not springboard scenarios, but actual draft maps, that's where we'll need to test this procedure. So I would ask commissioners to think about this in a little more detail. Please feel free to ask staff or council if you have questions. Please feel free to relay comments to them ahead of time and please bring any comments or questions that come to mind to the next meeting because we still have another meeting where we can talk through this. And we'll take all the comments that were brought on board just that were expressed just now and try to have some clearer answers on how to proceed. With that, not seeing any other commissioners, let me just give staff or council, well, Commissioner Inman, then I wanna ask staff or council if they have any comments. Commissioner Inman. Well, I would like to potentially consider we provide commissioner statements next week. I mean, I, I think people should come prepared. You know, we will have had a week with the existing springboards. New information will be public testimony along with uh, the racially polarized voting analysis, but I do think 
you know, uh, commissioners having an opportunity to reveal their preferences is going to help us a lot. On the springboards. On the springboards, okay. correct. Okay. On the springboards. Good. So. Okay, now hold on. Okay, Commissioner Serban, please. We committing any preference to any of the springboards. We're, we're, we're not preferencing one springboard map over another. We're talking about what we like or don't like about the maps. The exactly, what we okay. like and don't like. You're, you're correct. And I think that it would be useful for each commissioner to have one minute or two minutes of time where they can provide those statements. And they can actually say that they prefer one scenario over another. I mean, that's useful. You just need to explain why. So that's the same as providing directives. So I do believe a period where each commissioner has a two minute uh, time limit to provide uh, a statement of preference regarding the scenarios would be appropriate because we do need to provide direction to flow coming out of that meeting. So there will be a motion that has to be passed that does provide specific direction to flow and we have to have the information we we need to come to consensus on that motion. I don't want to discuss extend the discussion too much on this. I will just encourage commissioners um, that you've you've got a an outline of how those statements might work when we have the discussion. Uh, if you're inclined to make such a statement as part of your remarks, we'll certainly take a look at it and I'll certainly try to entertain at least one time around with those time limits uh, to give every commissioner a chance to express themselves on the springboards if they're so interested. And if not, no harm done. Good on that. Um, Barbara, Marguerite, Hillary, any comments? No comments from staff at this time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Marguerite? Hi, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, really fabulous meeting. Um, I would number one, agree that if the motion procedure and the rules doesn't work, it can always be suspended. But I don't think the intent was to cut off discussion on a motion. We have never had a situation where we have three unrelated motions on the floor, uh, subject to further discussion with uh, uh, Commissioner Inman and uh, the officers and bringing proposals back to the commission uh, whether we suspend the rules or not, I would imagine that motions would be subject to friendly amendments, um, substitute motions, et cetera, as any other motion. But we wouldn't have motion A and then completely unrelated motion B on the table on the floor at the same time. We'd finish one motion some way or other and then move on to the next. So um it's a really a, a very perceptive question. And I think we need a little bit of discussion to make sure we know what that looks like. I had never imagined that uh, a motion wouldn't be subject to a development, a single motion development in the discussion. Thank you for that. All right, not seeing any other comments. This concludes the business before the Independent Redistricting Commission tonight. Our next meeting will be a regular meeting next Thursday, October 14th at 2 p.m. And I want to just remind commissioners because it's been a little while, I think some, we've had a hybrid meeting at 2 p.m. So please keep that in mind. We are scheduled to meet here at the County Administration Center, 1600 Pacific Highway, room 302, San Diego, 92101, and virtually again via Zoom. More details and meeting links, again, are available on our website, www.drawyourcommunity.com. Thanks to members of the public who joined us tonight. Thank you, commissioners. Thanks to staff and uh, clerk and council, and especially to staff who helped us navigate through these technical difficulties. It's appreciated. With that, this meeting is adjourned at 6.44 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>